Chapter 4. And as we continue the theme till the end of the year of grow, specifically spiritual growth, I want to have a small checkup, if you will, and I want you to evaluate yourself and some of the areas that you have grown, Lord willing, this past year, or that you may say that you want to continue growing in the month that's left of this year. I want to ask how you measure up on certain areas of your spiritual growth. To grow in the Spirit means you're not growing in your selfishness, but you're reducing selfishness, and you're becoming more like Christ. Today I want to specifically talk about a man named Barnabas. Barnabas. Uh, Brother brother Jake is saying, uh, he has a dog named Barnabas, they call him Barney. (laughs) We wanted to borrow it for our dog, we ended up calling, we went with Ezekiel, we call him Zeke. So if anybody else has any great dog names, let me know. Barnabas was a great example in the Bible of somebody that loved to serve other people. He went out of his way to help people and assist people to help others to grow, to teach them the Word of God, to get them saved, to get them in church. He even did a lot of the service around the church, some interesting things about him. This won't be exhaustive, but I want to give you a few places in Acts, we'll look today, And the title of this Sunday School lesson is Becoming Like Barnabas. I often say that a church, you know, people have all these different theories. The church is as strong as uh, the weakest member, or the pastor's studying, or there's many different opinions on that. One that I like to talk about is the Barnabas factor. The Barnabas factor. Um, Because... Church means assembly or congregation. It means a multitude of people coming together in unity to serve the Lord. And the Lord does have a pattern with church as far as leaders, uh, preachers, and uh, uh, deacons. There's a biblical pattern for organization. The Lord does everything organized, decently and in order. But it's not about one man. It cannot be about one man. Uh, No great company rests on the shoulders of one man. I throw out this term, the Barnabas factor, because it's really about how we all work together to serve each other for God's glory. A way that we can serve God is to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm thankful for you young men that watch the door, that get umbrellas for the ladies on a rainy day, that get bulletins to people and just help find seats and uh, show somebody where we're at when they come in late so they know what song we're on. What a great way to serve other people. I thank you young men for doing that. I'm thankful to the young ladies that help with the cleaning chores around here. There are a lot of different people in that help clean up after the mess, if you will. Uh, you know, it's not like a restaurant. I tell you, I go down to the restaurant and the table's clean when I get there and I leave, it's a mess. I come back, it's clean again. It must be magic. No, there's people that have to do work to make it uh, decently and in order. And I'm very thankful to those that put in the extra effort to try to make things presentable and clean and sanitary for everybody else. That is part of the Barnabas factor, serving other people, helping other people. You're in Acts chapter 4. I want you to see verse number 36. Acts chapter 4, verse number 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted, the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is our introduction to this man Barnabas. It's the first time we see him. He was originally called Joseph. Joseph. This is perhaps a shortened version of Joseph. Jesus had a brother named Joseph. His father was Joseph. It's entirely possible this name was kind of a term like a junior, or you know how sometimes people shorten names uh, we also see, I think it's in, is it Matthew or in Mark, where you see what we would call Jose. It's actually Jose, right? Uh, it's a very similar name. So he had a name of Joseph, probably, but it doesn't say Joseph. It says Joseph. That's how they called him. It was slightly different. 
But then they gave him the name of Barnabas. Now, the Bible being our dictionary, it tells us which being interpreted is the son of consolation. So he was given this nickname called Barnabas uh, for producing comfort, for serving others. Those that were grieved, he would help them. Those that uh, needed encouragement or teaching, this was your guy. He was the one that would come alongside them and help them and work with them. That word consolation, as it reads in verse 36, consolation is something that gives comfort or relief to someone. So he gave comfort. He relieved others. Uh, if you're working on, on a project all by yourself and somebody comes alongside and they relieve you and help you carry that burden, that's the kind of guy that this was. We see also here that he was of the Levitical priesthood. He had a Levitical heritage. So he was probably well studied in the Old Testament scriptures. But then we notice that he donated the proceeds of a property that he sold on the island of Cyprus. And he took all that money and he gave it to the apostles that were in charge of the church at Jerusalem. It says he laid it down at their feet. You know, oftentimes we give a gift and then we want to tell people how to use it. Well, you know, it reminds me of David when his mighty man broke through and went and got the water from the pool of uh, Bethlehem. And they went and got this water and they brought it to David and he realized what a sacrifice they made. So he poured it out as a poor offering, the sacrifice unto the Lord. Those men did not say, hey, no, David, you're supposed to drink it. They just gave it to David as they served him, as they served the Lord. Much in the same way, Barnabas just said, hey, I sold all this stuff from this country I used to be in. I'm here in Jerusalem and here I'm giving it all to you. Do with it what you will. I want to make a couple points about Barnabas in that he looked like Jesus Christ. Barnabas looked like the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 9 it says, And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. When Jesus instructed his disciples, he said, hey, you want to be great in God's eyes? Here's what you do. You're behind everybody else. Here's what you do. You serve everybody else. When you do that, then just like Jesus, you'll be the greatest in the kingdom. Remembering that Jesus bowed down on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples, including Judas, the one that would betray him that very night. What an expression of love. What an awesome God that we serve. He will gird Himself and serve us in the kingdom, which blows my mind because I don't deserve God serving me. I don't deserve anything except punishment. I'm thankful for the gift of God. I'm thankful for the forgiveness of sins. And I ought to be thankful for the opportunity to serve God. And we do that on earth by helping others. And we need to embrace this thought of being thankful for service, it's a privilege. It's also our duty. It's also our duty. If you would go to uh, Acts chapter 13. Go to Acts chapter number 13. In Romans 15, 3 it says, For even Christ pleased not Himself. He didn't come down to earth to say, Okay, now God is manifest in the flesh on the earth. I've always wanted to try mangoes. Right? Or cow tongue tacos, or he didn't want it, it wasn't about some obscure dish or flavor. He created everything. And, I mean, and I'm sure he enjoyed the food and he enjoyed the fellowship, but his whole purpose that he came down was to teach us and give us an example of serving others. This man, Joseph, looked like Jesus so much they called him Barnabas, which means the son of consolation. Like you've came to console other people. There is a fruit, the production of spiritual fruit in your life so much that you look like Jesus by consoling others and loving others. In Philippians 2 it says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The Lord Jesus Christ came in the form of a servant as a lamb, he will return as a conquering king and as a lion. And he will pour out his wrath on this wicked earth and he will set up his kingdom. He came the first time in humility 
and lowliness and service, He came in the form of a servant. Everybody that saw Him, that's all they could say was He served others. What a reputation. In these aspects, Barnabas really did look like Jesus. I want you to think about the spiritual gifts. And I want to give you a piece of homework. We won't go there this morning. I wanted to, but I realized it would take way too much time. We see the spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can remember that. Romans and Corinthians, both in chapter 12. I want to give you the homework assignment of finding some time this week to get out a sheet of paper, a notepad, open it up to these passages, and I want you to write through and say, what did Barnabas look like? What of these spiritual gifts? Because not everybody has every spiritual gifts. God builds the church with people that have unique spiritual gifts, and we come together as puzzle pieces creating this big picture. But I want you to consider Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 as some homework, where I want you to read it for yourself and say, what did Barnabas look like? Which one of these gifts did he represent so much that they called him the son of consolation? Because I tell you, when you serve others like Christ, that is evidence of you growing into your spiritual gifts. And I really believe that every one of you has a certain number of gifts, and there's another package waiting for you to open it right now. And it may be that there's gift after gift after gift that you get to grow into. But if you stop and reject that moment of growth that God has you at in this point of life, then you may never see the fullness of God's will in your life. He does have a plan for you. He really does. But we have to see it and embrace it. You're in Acts chapter 13. I want to look at three verses in this chapter, starting in verse number 1. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas. It goes on and gives a list, but who was Barnabas? Well, he was a prophet and he was a teacher. Now there is no new prophecy. The Pentecostals that say, I have a special word for you. And it's like, no, no, I have a special word for you and it's all in here. And you say something that contradicts this, we're going to have a problem, right? Uh, God's prophecy has been fulfilled. However, the word prophecy means to preach. That means to show forth what God has said. And there are new applications every day for you in your life. There's no new prophecy. I can't, oh, God showed me last night that such and such is going to happen in New York City. You say, yeah, that's bogus. But here's what I can say. Boy, if New York City keeps doing that weird stuff, God's going to judge it. I can say something like that because He's already told us in His Word what He believes and what He'll do. Yeah. He was a prophet and a teacher. Preaching and teaching are two different skill sets. Amen? Amen? Some men are really good at teaching, but not so good at, I guess, delivering the whole message and preaching, or vice versa. Not every sermon is um, the same. And I try to use Sunday school hour here as a time of teaching, not necessarily preaching. I really want to focus on giving you facts, good, solid things that you can grow with. That's why I like looking at certain characters in the Bible as we look at Barnabas today. Um, in Acts 13, go to verse 43. Go to verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So here's Paul and Barnabas. Boy, those words almost always go together. Uh, Barnabas was the guy in the shadow, okay with being in the shadow, to get Paul where he needed to be to accomplish more for the Lord. It wasn't a competition, although in a sense God has given us a competition, but the reward's in heaven. And you have so many rewards you can get, and I'm not trying to outshow you, but I'm just trying to out show my old self and say, here's where I stopped, and now here's where I'm growing more. Barnabas recognized that God would use him in special ways, and it says here that at the end of it, it said, he's speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Barnabas has a great reward in heaven for speaking to people and persuading people to continue in God's grace. 
He says, now that you understand the doctrine of salvation, that it's all through the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you don't have Jesus Christ, then you're not His children, you're not saved, you will go to hell. He did everything He could to persuade them. That's a great characteristic that every one of us can get better at. Look at verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. You see that? Bold. Barnabas was bold. Barnabas was a humble guy and he was a servant, but when, it, when the time came to take a stand for what was right, he was bold. It says, uh, Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the Word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now think about who's speaking here. Paul and Barnabas, two highly educated men in what we call the Old Testament, the oracles of God, the scriptures of that time. They said, we have the covenants and the promise. And he said, and you're missing Jesus. And you had the word of God as a witness against you. And they boldly told them, therefore, we're going to take it to the rest of the nations because God is not willing that any should perish. They preached salvation. Uh, go back to Acts 11, if you would. Go to Acts chapter 11. If you would, look at verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So word makes it back to Jerusalem, People are getting saved all over the place. They're hearing about Jesus and believing. And people are getting saved and on fire and the gospel's being preached. Miracles are happening. And they said, we need to send somebody that can take care of business. Barnabas is the guy. Well, you know, it ought to be said of every one of us that we can be a faithful witness. Right. That we can take care of the business of God. That when God's looking for somebody that is faithful to the Scriptures and not selfish, that's faithful to the mission of telling them about Christ, that was Barnabas. And I ask you, are you becoming like Barnabas? Because Barnabas was like Christ. And he's one example of a living man that showed us that it was possible, what was possible when you just sold out to everything else in the world. Didn't he just sell out? We use that phrase, and I don't mean it in a negative light. No, no, he sold everything, and he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to preach, I'm going to help, I'm going to build churches, I'm going to build people, I'm going to go wherever they want me to go. I mean, Jesus had no certain dwelling place. He was always going from one place to another. He didn't carry some big cart full of food with him, and, oh, i got to get my tent. I mean, you see these homeless people, right? I mean, they're pushing a shopping buggy full of goods and stuff, and they got a backpack, and they go and hide it in the woods because... You know, well, they have a kind of a certain dwelling place, but they're all in the flesh. Jesus, on the other hand, boy, he, he took his shoes and he went. Barnabas, much in the same way, he cashed out his property, he gave it to the church, and then he left and went to another church. He said, let's go build Antioch now, and we'll stay there for a season, then we'll go over here, and then he, he came back. Uh, look at verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. When it says exhort, exhort means to encourage, it means to motivate. He's challenging them to continue. He's encouraging them. Notice it, sell, it says that in verse 23, exhorted them all. That means he helped everyone in the church. It would be said that everyone in the church could say, boy, that Barnabas, he has helped me personally. Everyone in the church in some way could say, thank God for Barnabas serving and helping and teaching. What an awesome testimony. Notice he says that with purpose of heart. With purpose of heart. You know, your purpose, that's seeing your calling or your ministry. Every one of you has a calling or a ministry that the Lord has for you. And he says that with purpose of of heart. You would see what God's will is for you, find that calling, and then do it with all of your heart. Do it to the best of your ability. 
Do it until the Lord comes. Just go all in, if you will. But notice he says that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. Cleave, that means get close to God. That means stay close to God. Make it your number one priority to grow with God daily, especially through His Word, through prayer, through singing, through preaching, through speaking to others. It's neat. They were excited to learn of Jesus and His awesome gift. And Barnabas shows up and helps them learn more so that they could turn around and share it with others. It wasn't a one-man show by any means. In fact, Barnabas, I believe his mentality was, when I find somebody that has a zeal for the Lord, I'm going to get them even more fired up so that they can go out and instruct many others. Imagine if Barnabas trained 10 people and those 10 people went out and got 10 more and 10 more. And that's exactly how the church grew. That people loved others enough to bring them in. Now this is problematic because, you know, in Antioch they didn't have the Scriptures like we were raised with, right? Most of us are raised Christian and we have a fear of the Lord, right? I mean, in Antioch some of those people were, they were heathens. And he brought them into the church and he trained them in the will of the Lord and in the Scriptures and he prepared their hearts to understand God's promise. They didn't have to understand all of the Old Testament. They had to know who God was and who Jesus was and what He did. And then they could begin to build as they worked out their own salvation and began to sanctify their lives by submitting to the will of God. I look at verse number 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. He was a good man. He had an upright reputation. He had favor with God and man. Isn't, it, isn't that neat? To say, he was a good man. There's not many you can say that. Who can find a faithful man? Not many these days. It says he was full of the Holy Ghost. I really believe that the spiritual gifts were just abounding and it was evident that he was spending time with the Lord, therefore he was a blessing to others whenever he ministered to them. It says he was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. So he was full of faith. That means he trusted God for everything. He wasn't worried about the rain or the snow or the Romans or the Jews. He wasn't worried about the debt. He wasn't worried. I mean, you think about it. I mean, he was just totally walking by faith. We're saved by faith, and now we should walk by faith and grow in our faith every day. And he was doing that. He was living it out. And I really believe that he, through that, encouraged others to trust God for more. Once they trusted him with salvation, then they began to understand, this is the God that has fed me my whole life. And He will continue to feed me and guide me and protect me. He was full of faith. But then it says, and much people were added unto the Lord. You know, He was an evangelist. He was a soul winner. He was a church builder. And He did it by building individual bricks. This building here was built brick by brick. Each one had to go through the fire on its own. And today it stands as a unified structure. It's an illustration of how God uses individual people to build His local body so that we can help others outside of here to get them on fire for the Lord. If you would look at verse 25, it says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now, so he sees what's going on. He starts helping. He has a good reputation. Things are happening. But then he's like, wait a minute. I hear of Saul. We've heard what's going on. I'm going to go get Saul because this guy can really help this ministry. Think about it. Verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Again, Barnabas teaching many people, assembling with them, helping them. And the way that Barnabas lived ended up where the people in Antioch were called like Christ. Barnabas looked like Christ, and the people that he taught ended up looking like Christ also so much they called them Christians, which is to say, those disciples of Christ, they, are like, they want to be like a little Christ. And Christ went about in the form of a servant, being the servant of all, having compassion on the lost. 
teaching, preaching, having boldness when it was necessary, especially serving and loving the brethren in the church. I mean, it was the kind of church when they, people walked in, they just felt like, man, these guys love each other and these families are helping each other and they're all trying to look like Jesus. That makes sense. What an awesome testimony. The word Christian can be attributed to Barnabas. He wanted to look like Christ. He wanted his friends to look like Christ. He wanted his church to look like Christ. And that's what was said of Antioch because they served each other as Christ served his disciples and the lost. That was the reputation. That was the name that was given them. Again, Barnabas was trained in the Old Testament Scriptures. He probably knew them really well being a Levite. And he invested the remainder of his life just serving others, teaching others how Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies of salvation to come. That he was the answer. Barnabas built churches by building people with encouragement and comfort. Let's serve one another so that we look like Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for this man Barnabas that gives us a great example of how it is possible to follow You and look like You and grow into our spiritual gifts. Lord, I just ask that today as we start church here, Lord, I just pray that You would help us all to have that awesome spirit of serving others and loving You. Lord, I ask that You would get all the glory today in the church service through the singing and the Bible reading and the preaching. Lord, we love You. We're very thankful for what You've done here. Help us to have a name as Antioch, known as Christians. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.